Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. If there's one uh, topic that can overcome the challenge of being the last uh, panel on a beautiful day in Newport, uh, that topic would have to be uh, means and methods in NIAC. And we are very fortunate to have three of the most uh, distinguished experts in the field with us here today. Air Commodore Bill Boothby, Professor Dr. Wolf Heinschel von Heinig, and Mr. Dick Jackson. You have their impressive bios in your materials. And our rules of engagement for this panel will be roughly the same as the previous panels. Uh, each speaker will speak for 20 to 30 minutes. Then we will open the floor for questions. Uh, we will end promptly at 1730. So if you have a question after 1730, please take it to the icebreaker at the O Club and ask it over a beer. So without further ado, I will turn over the floor to Air Commodore Bill Boothby. Thank you very much. I shall try to keep my voice up and I shall try to make sure I'm heard both here and as we in England call it, in another place. Uh, my thanks to Professor Mansager for his very kind invitation to come here and speak. My sincere apologies for my visit being an absolutely flying visit, uh, but uh, I have a few things to uh, bring to a conclusion back in England. Uh, it truly is, however, an honor to be here and uh, uh, my congratulations to Mike Schmidt. I do not speak for the Royal Air Force, I do not speak for the UK MOD, I do not speak for the UK government, and I will not have to say that again. I will address some specific questions during the next few minutes. Feel free to pose others, other issues and other questions uh, during the panel discussion. Time is of the essence, so here goes. Is there still a meaningful weapons law distinction between NIAC on the one hand and international armed conflict on the other? Well, the fundamental principles of superfluous injury, unnecessary suffering, and the prohibition of weapons uh, that are indiscriminate by nature apply equally, in my view, in both types of conflict, and that, I think, is not controversial. For the 74 states that have ratified <coughs> the 2001 extension uh, of the scope of the Conventional Weapons Convention, and thus that of its protocols, that law applies for them equally in both categories of conflict. Amended Protocol 2 to the Conventional Weapons Convention always did, of course, apply to both, and the Arms Control Treaties the Chemical Weapons Convention, the Biological Weapons Convention, the Ottawa Convention, and indeed the Cluster Munitions Convention, also are so drafted that they apply to both. The never under any circumstances language in Article 1 of those respective conventions sees to that. But let us not then leap to the conclusion that the whole of the rest of the law of weaponry applies equally because in my view, it does not. Consider expanding bullets. As you will all be keenly aware, I'm sure, the Kampala Review Conference for the Rome Statute of the ICC, adopted on the 10th of June of 2010, last year, by consensus, Resolution 5, which amended Article 8 of the Rome Statute. It did so by inserting additional offenses under the heading, quote, other serious violations of the laws and customs applicable in armed conflicts not of an international character within the established framework of international law, close quote. Those additional offenses are, firstly, employing poison or poisoned weapons. Secondly, employing asphyxiating, poisonous or other gases, and all analogous liquids, materials, or devices. And thirdly, employing bullets which expand or flatten easily in the human body, such as bullets with a hard envelope, which does not entirely cover the core, or is pierced with incisions. The reference in the headnote to the words, the established framework of international law, 
makes it clear that the states that adopted this provision by consensus are asserting that these activities, when conducted in the course and context of a non-international armed conflict, are activities known to customary law as being offences. I don't think that there is any controversy about that assertion as it applies to the poison, poisoned weapons and asphyxiating gas provisions. I think we can safely conclude that these activities breach customary international law when undertaken in a non-international armed conflict and that they are offences known to customary international law. But what about expanding bullets? In negotiating the third Hague Declaration of 1899 concerning expanding bullets, the plenipotentiaries agreed, quote, to abstain from the use of bullets which expand or flatten easily in the human body, such as bullets with a hard envelope which doesn't entirely cover the core or is pierced with incisions, close quotes. When negotiated, the declaration was subject to a general participation clause such that it only applied in relation to a war between states party and ceased to apply if a non-party state joined the conflict. Hayes Parks has made the point that militaries of all nations used only full metal jacketed bullet, but bullets before and after the adoption of the declaration, mainly in his view, because they were the only ones that would function reliably when fired from military weapons. He therefore speculates whether compliance was due to law of war considerations or military reliability concerns. No lesser authority than Christopher Greenwood has expressed doubts that the 1899 declaration was customary law. He considered the matter in relation to the distinction principle. He was contemplating the sort of expanding ammunition which may be more accurate or less likely to ricochet or overpenetrate than full metal jacketed ammunition and which thus would reduce the risks to innocent civilians during urban or counter-terrorist operations. In such circumstances, he wondered whether some increased potential for injury for the combatant or terrorist target would necessarily amount to superfluous injury. The thought he was putting forward was that the protection of civilians under the principle of distinction in those circumstances might outweigh considerations of additional injury to the targeted individual. To take this analysis one stage further, I have in the past suggested that in particular military circumstances, expanding bullets may be the weapon of choice. For example, in order to stop a terrorist detonating a bomb or abducting a hostage or in some similar circumstances. However, the International Committee of the Red Cross in its customary law study finds the following rule, quotes, to you, the use of bullets which expand or flatten easily in the human body is prohibited, close quotes. The ICRC study asserts that this customary rule applies in both international and non-international armed conflicts. One difficulty with the ICRC's formulation is that the phrase, quotes, bullets which expand, close quotes, can be interpreted in a number of ways. It could mean bullets which are designed or designed or adapted in order to expand, or bullets which in the normal or intended circumstances of use will normally or inevitably expand, or even bullets which are capable of expanding. While there is no doubt that there is a rule of customary law in relation to expanding bullets, one doubts that that rule has been correctly formulated in the current text of the ICRC study. On balance, it would seem most likely that any such rule will be based on the design, purpose, and intent of the weapon, rather than on how it might behave in unspecified, but perhaps particular, circumstances. Interestingly, the ICRC study acknowledges that several states have decided to use such ammunition in domestic law enforcement operations. Ken Watkin, in a 2006 article, indicates that rather more states have done this than the word several would imply. <laughs>
The ICRC asserts, however, in the customary law study, that the use of such ammunition by police forces occurs in situations other than armed conflict, and that the bullets are fired from particular kinds of firearm that deposit less energy than a rifle bullet. The purpose, of course, for using such bullets in domestic law enforcement will usually be to stop the individual quickly and before he has the opportunity to act in a potentially extremely damaging way. The range and circumstances of use of the weapon by law enforcement officers may or may not be different to the circumstances in which members of the armed forces will be inclined to use such weapons. There's also, of course, the point that for a number of countries, the weapons and ammunition used by members of the armed forces are likely to be substantially the same as those used by the internal security or police forces. The ICRC has, in its customary law study, frequently argued that rules that apply in international armed conflict in the field of weapons law also apply in non-international armed conflict because the weapons used by the armed forces are the same as between both types of conflict. While I don't necessarily find that a particularly convincing argument, nevertheless it would seem illogical to take that line and then in the next breath as it were, to suggest that different rules on expanding bullets apply as between police forces and armed forces units, recognizing as one well must that in many states the weapons used and sometimes even the users are the same. When the Kampala Conference delegates adopted the additions to Article 8, they inserted into the resolution the following important preambular paragraph, and I quote, considering that the crime proposed in Article 8, paragraph 2C15, brackets, employing bullets, I wrote here billets, one has to be very careful when you're doing typing, don't you? Employing bullets, which expand or flatten easily in the human body, close brackets, is also a serious violation of the laws applicable in armed conflict, not of an international character. And understanding that the crime is committed only if the perpetrator employs the bullets to uselessly aggravate suffering or the wounding effect upon the target of such bullets as reflected in customary international law, close quotes. So what do we make of that? Well, on the positive side, it usefully provides that the offense is only committed in NIAC if the bullets are used uselessly to aggravate the suffering or injury. If therefore there is military utility attached to the additional injury or suffering, for example, in the sense which we've been discussing, then the offense will not be made out. It is, of course, essential that this preambular paragraph is given sufficient prominence in all discussions, analysis, reporting of the offense, as well as in any proceedings for any offense that may be alleged under it. But a careful analysis of the preambular words may lead to the interpretation um, implying that the use of such bullets in all circumstances in NIAC breaches international law. Such an interpretation would suggest that the preambular caveat only applies to the offense provision. So it would suggest that they're asserting it's unlawful, but it's only an offense if it's done uselessly <coughs> to aggravate. But given what we said previously, how can that be right? But I offer that somewhat academic point only as an aside. My main observation is that expanding bullets clearly represent a point of distinction between the law applicable in international armed conflict and that applying in NIAC. In international armed conflict, the offense is not tied to superfluous injury and unnecessary suffering. In NIAC, it seems it is. And there's another point of difference under CCW, under the Conventional Weapons Convention, which is, I guess, fairly obvious. Namely, 
that the protocols, other than amended protocol two, only apply equally to both classes of conflict for states that have ratified the relevant protocol and the 2001 extension of scope. For the states that have not ratified the scope extension, <coughs> The difference between international and non-international armed conflict legal provision remains. This has the follow-on consequence that fewer states are bound by those rules in respect of non-international armed conflict, which may, it won't necessarily, but it may have the effect that the achievement of a customary rule based on the language of a particular protocol may happen after the equivalent customary rule has already crystallized in relation to international armed conflict. I therefore think that the International Committee of the Red Cross should have been rather more hesitant when finding weapons law rules applying as a matter of customary law in non-international armed conflict based on relatively recently adopted CCW protocols. I cannot close without saying something about the natural environment. Under NMOD, the Environmental Modification Convention of 1976, of course, states party undertake not to engage in military or any other hostile use of environmental modification techniques having widespread long-lasting or severe effects as the means of destruction, damage or injury to any other state party. If the technique is not employed by a state party, or if the destruction, damage, or injury is not applied to another state party, it is at face value hard to see how this provision is engaged. So here again, we would seem to have a point of difference as between international and non-international armed conflict. Finally, we should consider Articles 35 and 55 of AP1 in relation to the environment, rules which again apply in relation to weapons and means of warfare. I appreciate, of course, that these provisions are one of the reasons for US non-ratification of the treaty. Putting that to one side, the fact remains that for states that are party to AP1, the treaty rules apply only in relation to international armed conflict. The ICRC argues that the rule applies also in non-international armed conflict. Rule 45 of the study refers. And the NIAC manual also suggests such a rule, but at least the NIAC manual makes no claim as to the customary status of the rules that it articulates. So perhaps the safest course is to stick to the finding that there is a difference in the application of the treaty rules and to indicate that the position at customary law is, to put it mildly, controversial. Having established that there are these differences in the applicable law, the final question to pose is whether such differences make sense. You might wonder whether the law should differ between international and non-international armed conflict, or should it be the same? Maybe that's the wrong question. Indeed, I'd suggest to you that the questions to consider are how long will it be before all CCW states party ratify the 2001 extension in scope? How long will it be before the Environmental Modification Convention is clearly made to apply in the case of non-international armed conflict? How long will it be before the points we have discussed in relation to expanding bullets are seen to have resonance in international and non-international armed conflict? And how long before those that accept the environmental rules in AP1 do so in relation to both classes of conflict? States are and will remain in charge of the process of creating international law. And it is states that therefore will determine the answers to these questions. The process of legal convergence is clearly underway, but has not yet produced universally identical 
provision. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Our next uh, panelist will be Professor von Heineck. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dennis, thanks for having invited me again. Mike, uh, uh, I will never, that's what I just wanted to say. Uh, since you will be the successor of Dennis, that it will be my last conference in Newport. So uh, a farewell by me. Um, well, originally I was, uh, was thinking of talking about uh, the principles surrounding the use of method and means of warfare in non-international armed conflict. Uh, I would have referred to the so-called Kunduz incident of 2009. You may remember the attack on the two tank trucks and the ensuing proceedings, especially by the federal prosecutor general in Germany. I won't do that uh, because I was also asked uh, to talk about the use of naval method and means of warfare in non-international armed conflict. Uh, at first glance, you may say, oh, naval, uh, how can that be? Well, I will show you some examples uh, of real life out there where indeed uh, naval method and means of warfare were used in a non-international armed conflict. Uh, but before I do that, I would like to make some general statements um, about uh, the applicable use in bellow when it comes to non-international armed conflict. Now, don't misunderstand me. I don't take the chance of commenting upon all those who have been on that panel before and uh, comment upon my colleagues. But uh, when it comes to method and means of warfare, we should not forget that until, let's say, the 1990s, there were not too many rules ap applicable to non-international armed conflict related to method and means of warfare. Well, one may say, yes, probably chemical weapons, yes, uh, and biological weapons would have been prohibited in a non-international armed conflict as well. But beyond that, there were not too many rules in the 1990s. Of course, there was the emerging treaty law, Bill uh, has already referred to, that slowly but surely extended the scope of applicability of some treaties or some protocols at least to non-international armed conflicts, but that was and still is to a certain extent at least treaty law and certainly not indicative of customary international law. Uh, and don't forget that many of the protocols, for example, to the 1980s Weapons Convention are certainly not customary in character and that holds true for other uh, so-called humanitarian arms control treaties like the Cluster Munitions Convention and others. It needs to be emphasized, uh, moreover, that uh, the jurisprudence, especially of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, has had a rather significant impact on what some people believe the customary law is today. Uh, but only seemingly so. Uh, what we have to keep in mind is that the ICTY especially based many of its assumptions and conclusions on the basic and underlying assumption that there has been almost a total merger of the law applicable to international armed conflicts and non-international armed conflicts. Unfortunately, one of their references was the German Manual of 1992-1993. Uh, well, I cannot promise you anything because you should not promise anything about military manuals here at the Naval War College. We have done so for the last 20 years or so. But there may be a new version of the German Manual in some near or distant future, and I can assure you there will be uh, a separate chapter on non-international armed conflict and there won't be that merger any longer. But uh, let us not talk about the German manual, but what I try to make clear is that uh, we cannot only rely on the ICTY and other international criminal tribunals when it comes to identifying the status of customary international law applicable to non-international armed conflict. And I tried to make it clear in one of my interventions before, and I do it again, 
I think we have to have a sober look, look at what is really happening out there, what state practice is, and we cannot just rely on some statements of some very highly respected courts, but that's only criminal courts, and that's not necessarily uh, indicative enough of what uh, the customary law is about. Finally, uh, what we have to keep in mind is that even if we agree that there has been or there will be some kind of merger of those two bodies of law, uh, well, let's take that for granted for a moment, but that can never, ever be a one-way street. All those who are claiming that there has been such a merger are only hinting at prohibitions, at protective provisions of the law of international armed conflict. But they are very silent and uh, don't mention that if there is such a merger, then this, of course, must also hold true for the other, for the reverse side of the medal, meaning that, well, there are some rights going with that merger, like, for example, uh, identifying lawful targets and others. So now I you should know where I stand when it comes to identifying customary international law. And now let's have a short look at some of the incidents in state practice or of the practice of the parties to a conflict of non-international armed conflicts. We have heard today that uh, one of the earlier non-international armed conflicts was the Spanish Civil War. And it may surprise you that there was a naval element. And that na naval element even led to the conclusion of two, well, not really agreements, they were called arrangements, and that the so-called Neon arrangements that followed uh, the attacks by some unidentified submarines in the Mediterranean. Uh, the idea was to outlaw the use of unidentifiable submarines in such a conflict. Now, the Neon arrangements never made it to become customary international law. But it, show, it gives you a nice example that when it comes to the use of naval assets in the context of a non-international armed conflict, obviously some states, for whatever motives or reasons, are prepared to take certain legal consequences, even though at the end of the day they did not succeed. Another recent, more recent example is Libya. Um, now, of course, there is an international armed conflict between the coalition of the willing on the one side and Libya on the other side. But we shouldn't forget that there is also non-international armed conflict between the so-called rebels and the government forces. And uh, I give you a quote by a British brigadier whose name I cannot pronounce correctly. Is it Wayhill or Wagill? I don't know. But he said the following. We have just seen Gaddafi forces floating anti-ship mines outside Misrata today. It again shows his complete disregard for international law and his willingness to attack humanitarian delivery efforts. Now, this quote, uh, surprisingly for me at least, has been almost generally accepted. Nobody objected to that evaluation. But the question is whether the laying of mines indeed constituted a violation of international law applicable to non-international armed conflicts. The answer to the question may be affirmative if the focus is laid on the use ad bellum. But we all know that there are di many different interpretations of the respective Security Council resolutions. But I don't want to talk about that. I would, would just like to focus on the law of Inter non-international armed conflict. And if we look at that mine laying operation from that perspective, it is quite doubtful whether it would constitute a violation of the applicable use in Bell. After all, uh, there are of course international actors, but since there is a non-international armed conflict between the government forces and the rebel forces, I see no reason why that the applicable use in Bellow would prohibit either side to use naval mines to prevent egress from or ingress into a port held by the respective enemy. 
At least there is no customary uh, law or rule to that effect. If we look at another non-international armed conflict that was characterized by a quite remarkable naval element, well, then I, of course, need to refer to the conflict between the Tamil Tigers and the Sri Lankan government forces. Uh, well, there were numerous naval engagements. Uh, sometimes even the Tamil Tigers were victorious after those naval engagements. Uh, but there were, and that is interesting to note, by third states or other states, there were no remarkable protests when it, when it came to the use of method and means of naval warfare by both parties to that non-international armed conflict. There is only one incident during the Sri Lankan conflict that may raise some doubts as to the legality of the use of naval method and means of warfare. And the reports are less than reliable, I must caution you on that. But allegedly, India assisted the Sri Lankan government by establishing a blockade. But I am not sure whether this was a blockade at all, because at the end of the day, it was nothing but the assistance of the Indian naval forces to prevent the flow of arms via the sea to the Tamil Tiger forces. So it could be anything, but it was certainly not a blockade proper, at least not a blockade as we know it from the Paris Declaration of 1856. So it may have been some form of contraband control uh, where the Indian government assisted the Sri Lankan government, but again, there were no substantive protests by either states or of the region or by other states that may have been affected by those measures. So seemingly states agreed that the Sri Lankan government was entitled to take all necessary measures to prevent the shipment of arms to the rebels. Another non-international armed conflict, and now we go a little bit back into time again, uh, in which at least the state party applied methods of naval warfare uh, that used to be recognized in international armed conflicts only was the Algerian conflict between France and the colonies, so to speak. Now, I don't want to talk about Article 1.4 of Additional Protocol one, but let's assume that conflict was a non-international armed conflict. The French Navy during that conflict exercised extensive visit and search in the Mediterranean. And it's interesting to note that the French Navy did not limit its operations to the territorial sea of the Algerian coast, but it extended those operations up to 60 nautical miles north of Algeria. There, however, third states protested, partly heavily, against the measures taken by the French Navy. Now, some of you may expect me to also talk about uh, the so-called Gaza flotilla and the blockade of Gaza. Uh, Ken mentioned it today, but we have, of course, different character ca characterizations of the conflict. Is the Gaza conflict an international armed conflict or is it a non-international armed conflict? Ask two of us and you will get five different answers. But just for the argument's sake, if we agree that uh, it is a non-international armed conflict, and just for the argument's sake, because there are good and strong arguments in favor of an international character of that conflict, um, the question, of course, would be whether any party to that conflict would have been entitled to establish a naval blockade and enforce it vis-a-vis -vis the ships of other states. Well, I think you know that uh, the conflict in Gaza, despite of the two drawers you may use, either the international or the non-international one, is not e does not easily fit into either of the well-known categories. But uh, in any event, the question that the state actor, like the Sri Lankan government, would be entitled to pre prevent the flow of arms to the non-state actors during a non-international armed conflict is, at least by my, uh, in my view, beyond any doubt. The only question is whether and to what extent either of the parties to a non-international armed conflict 
would be entitled to interfere with shipping or even aviation in areas beyond the territorial sea, meaning in high seas areas or in international airspace. If the government limits or the governmental forces limit their measures to the territory, including the territorial sea, there can be no doubt about the legality of any blockade or interception or visit and search measures by the government. This is quite different when the non-state actors take such measures, because non-state actors would certainly not be entitled to claim rights vis-a-vis -vis the shipping or the aviation of other states. It becomes more complicated, of course, if and in so far the measures are taken beyond the territorial sea, meaning in sea areas uh, beyond the 12 nautical mile limit. But here again, uh, I think one has to distinguish between the government party and the non-state actors in a non-international armed conflict because we cannot ignore the fact that the governments would be entitled to extend certain rights beyond the territorial sea when it comes, for example, to the rights recognized by the law of the sea under the heading of the contiguous zone. So at the end of the day, I believe that uh, the law applicable to the use of naval methods of, and means of warfare in non-international armed conflict is, of course, far less developed than it is in international armed conflicts. But if and in so far the government forces decide to take control measures either of the aviation or the navigation of other states, there are good reasons to consider those measures as in accordance with the applicable law. Now, finally, I would also like to say something about the natural environment because any naval engagement may have a negative impact on the marine flora and fauna. I'm not referring to the NMOD uh, Convention and I can of course not refer to Additional Protocol 1 because that applies to international armed conflicts only. So consider that to be supplementary to what Bill has already said. So the only a document I could rely upon when it comes to the protection of the natural environment in a non-international armed conflict is, of course, the ICRC study. And if you look at the study, uh, you may be surprised to read that uh, the authors of the study seem to be prepared to accept a prohibition of harming the environment or, to put it mildly differently, that there would be an obligation to pay due regard to environmental considerations if, we, if the measures taken during a non-international armed conflict have negative impacts on the natural environment of other states. But if you look at the wording of the commentary in the study, it is very cautious. It says it can be argued. So there is no bold statement that during a non-international armed conflict, the parties to that conflict would be under an obligation to pay due regard to the natural environment of other states. And the commentary becomes even more cautious when it comes to the protection of the natural environment of the respective state that finds itself in a non-international armed conflict. Uh, the wording um, is characterized by the use of words like indications, may, some support, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it seems to be that uh, even the ICRC customary law study would not serve as a sufficient argument or reference to claim that there is an obligation by the parties to a non-international armed conflict to pay due regard to environmental considerations during a non-international armed conflict. I don't say that the commentary by the IC ICRC has been guided by political aspirations, so don't please misunderstand me. But it shows you that the authors of the study are less than secure. And it may be added that there is no generally accepted definition of the term natural environment. Don't forget that. Everybody seems to know what the natural environment is. But if I was asking any of you to tell me and to give me a definition 
I think there would be many differing proposals. They would range from a single fish to a whole marine ecosystem or other ecosystem, and we would certainly not agree on the extent and scope of the protection. Let me come to some concluding remarks. So according to the position I have taken here, there are no substantive rules of customary international law prohibiting the use of method and means of naval warfare in a non-international armed conflict. This, however, is different when it comes to belligerent measures affecting the navigation and aviation of other states, at least in those areas that are not covered by the territorial sovereignty of the respective states, state on whose territory the armed conflict takes place. Within the respective state's territory, the government forces are entitled to interfere with foreign shipping and, of course, aviation. If the non-state actors take similar measures, the government is under an obligation to take feasible precautions, for example, by extending warnings to international navigation to avoid the respective sea areas. In international waters and international airspace, in principle, no interference is allowed unless it is in compliance with the rules of the law of the sea applicable to the contiguous zone. The non-state actors are at all times prohibited from intercepting foreign vessels and aircraft. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Our final panelist is Mr. Dick Jackson. I'm fully cognizant of the fact that it's uh, 415 and I'm standing between you all and the beer across the street. So I'll, uh, I'll certainly cut this down from the projected 20 to uh, 30 minutes. But first, a couple of preliminary remarks. Um, my sling is not the result of uh, getting in a bar fight with a bunch of my ex-Special uh, Forces buddies. Um, it's a result of being a klutz and uh, tripping over my own feet and, uh, and breaking my collarbone and pulling my um, hamstring. Second, um, I'm here on completely false pretenses because uh, Dennis asked me to speak today to talk about uh, the Law of War Manual, the much promised, never delivered um, DOD Law of War Manual. And um, in particular, the law, the weapons uh, chapter and the NIAC chapter of the Law of War Manual. Now, let me tell you, those chapters exist and they're in a they're in a final draft form. Um, and, and Hayes Parks, as most of you know, retired on the 29th of October and delivered what he promised before he retired, um, which is a substantially complete work. But uh, within the US government, we have a, a, a process called the interagency process that uh, sometimes results in, in uh, delay in something that's as important as uh, this, this statement, uh, as many statements in the Law of War Manual. But I'm heartened by the fact that Steve Pomper talked today about one of those, one of the, the, um, the things that's tripping us up, uh, what, what uh, the U.S. government believes uh, DPH means, for example. So uh, maybe this time next year, if, uh, if you'll invite me back for that purpose, um, we'll, uh, we'll be able to talk about the Law of War Manual and its impact on, uh, on the law. So the, these are views of uh, Dick Jackson, not as the special assistant to the Judge Advocate General for Law of War Matters, um, but just as Dick Jackson. So if I say something stupid, um, you know who to blame, just me. Uh, I, I think it, it bears noting that there are some trends developing in this conference. And one of the, the trends that's uh, very obvious is the collapsing of international armed conflict rules into non-international conflict rules. Well, why is that? Um, it, I think it was best illustrated during the, the morning panel uh, by the comment that with, for the soldier on the ground in Iraq or Afghanistan, he couldn't put his finger on when the, the conflict shifted from an, not, an international armed, armed conflict to a non-international armed conflict. Well, up, up at the Washington level of the Pentagon, angels dance on the head of a pin all day long, and we certainly couldn't come to agreement there. 
but, but my focus as, a, as an attorney and as a JAG has always been on the guys and gals on the ground. And for them, they need a, a means to conduct disciplined um, operations. And so, so this policy approach of applying the law of armed conflict in military operations, no matter how characterized, although it's a, uh, it's a bit of a dodge in terms of, of application of law, is, is the most effective way to make sure that our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marine conduct, uh, conduct uh, disciplined military operations. Uh, then the other, the other trend that uh, I think we see developing is in the reliance on customary international law to define the law that, uh, that doesn't exist. As Sean said, you know, he, he searched and found a void and um, it was very difficult to describe that void without, uh, uh, because there is no positive law uh, that exists there. So um, the topic uh, I've chosen for today for the next 10 minutes or so is uh, perfidy in NIAC. I'll get this right. One. Okay. There we go. Is this the most violated uh, form of uh, of the law in non-international armed conflicts? Well, I I dare say that uh, willful and wanton killing of civilians is the is the uh, most prevalent uh, grave breach or serious crime committed in in law of armed conflict. But uh, these are four. For examples, uh, that perfidy is very close to being the um, the most most violated uh, law in law uh, in non-international armed conflict. On the left-hand uh, side of the screen is a uh, young suicide bomber in Afghanistan. On the right, at the top, is an ambulance uh, employed in Somalia by um, Al Shabaab to attack a, a government uh, outpost on the lower left-hand corner talks about an Iraqi uh, ambulance bomb, and on the lower right-hand corner is a suicide bomber um, dressed in civilian clothing who, uh, who created that big a blast in, uh, in a, um, a non-international armed conflict now in Afghanistan. I, I think it bears r repeating or, or at least some brief discussion of where we are and the spectrum of conflict. We're, we're in the non-international armed conflict spectrum and we've talked about all four of these triggers of uh, non-international armed conflict, but we haven't talked much about what Tadic tells us in terms of what law is available to interpret uh, our conduct in non-international armed conflict and, that, and Tadic as well as providing a an interpretation of common article three tells us that common, that uh, customary international law is available to, uh, to, to define our conduct in non-international armed con conflict. Uh, now this, this is, is again my personal opinion as to the intersection of human rights law and the law, and, uh, the law of armed conflict. So uh, the non-extraterritorial application of, uh, of human rights law it, that the U.S. government uh, position has been would erase that uh, lower yellow line, at least in terms of uh, international armed conflict. But there's a, a significant development uh, this uh, within the last few months that uh, that was little noticed, and that was the announcement by the president that uh, at the same time he announced the law of war detention regime that we comply with uh, Article 75 of Additional Protocol 1 in international armed conflict out of a sense of legal obligation, first. Second, the intent to ratify Additional Protocol 2. And that intent is important for this uh, human rights discussion because uh, Articles 4 through 6 of Additional Protocol 2 essentially mimic Article 75 and lay out uh, what I would contend are non-derogable human rights that are applicable in non-international armed conflict. Okay, that doesn't have much to do with perfidy, but uh, at least it tells us where we are in the spectrum. This is the, the definition of perfidy in, uh, in Additional Protocol 1. Now, how much of that in the, in the, the top uh, paragraph is 
uh, customary international law, or at least is applicable in non-international armed conflict. Yesterday, I got a copy of uh, this helpful manual on uh, non-international armed conflict. And, uh, and I would submit that everything except for uh, the words or capture and the or in that uh, second set of illustrative examples are um, the rules for non-international armed conflict. And I'll talk about why um, I, I take capture out of the uh, definition, but uh, the or uh, just is to clarify that the U.S. approach to non-combatants is to define non-combatants as those that are out of those combatants that are out of combat or are medical or religious personnel that uh, they're not civilians um, in in our definition of non-combatants. Now, where does this perfidy come from? Well, it comes back from uh, 1907 Hague regulations, really, and the definition of treacherous killing or wounding, and also from a, a bit of a, nation, a notion of chivalry. Uh, there, there, is, there are some commentators, including uh, Dieter Fleck in his handbook on, on international um, humanitarian law, that include uh, the use of enemy uniforms as a form of perfidy. But, um, at a minimum, uh, I would submit that uh, using the uniforms of the enemy is a prohibited act on the battlefield in non-international armed conflict as well as international armed conflict. And uh, I think, again, the, the NIAC uh, manual uh, bears that out. Um, why? Why is perfidy so important? Well, when you look at, uh, at the travaux preparatoire for uh, for the, the additional protocol too. The, the, the drafters really wanted to take all of the means and methods, all of the, the core targeting principles and move them into uh, non-international armed conflict. And they were stymied by states that were worried about uh, internationalization of their internal armed conflicts. So what the drafters did was they moved principles um, key principles into additional protocol um, two. And, uh, and th those key principles, uh, particularly the principle of distinction, are, are uh, specifically mentioned in additional protocol two. But the details of how the, those principles are enforced are left out of the discussion of, of in additional protocol two. So um, my, my view is that uh, perfidy uh, fleshes out and makes criminal the uh, violations of the principle of distinction. And so it, it provides a benefit to the, to, the, um, to the interpretation of this basic principle, um, and including the, um, and that in, in the commentary, for example, they talk about indiscriminate attacks as not being specifically um, limited by um, by additional protocol too, but yet a concept that is incorporated into the principle of distinction that is, uh, um, that is included. Other provisions do the same thing. Uh, the, the basic uh, protections that come go to the sick and wounded, that uh, say there uh, no quarter shall be given, that uh, protect um, the use of distinctive emblems, all of these have at a minimum, the respect and protect requirements incorporated in additional protocol two, and two of them include prohibitions on misuse. And I would include that in uh, the medical personnel analysis uh, from Article 9 and Article 11. So this, um, th this uh, balanced approach of having a principle and then prohibiting misuse of the protection is, is clearly um, enunciated within additional protocol too. It's just that the limitation or the sanction of perfidy is not included specifically in additional pro protocol too. Okay, what about capture? Um, Operation Checkmate, uh, the, the Colombians call it Operation Jaque, um, which is the Spanish version of Checkmate. And um, it, it consisted of a, a very elaborate ruse getting the, uh, the, the, the um, um, call sign and the frequencies of, of a 
individual that was supplying the um, FARC in a what is clearly a non-international armed conflict in, in uh, Colombia. And then using, using that information to arrange to move in a humanitarian gesture to move to a safer location several of the prisoners that were held um, by the FARC. Now, as a result, um, uh, the uh, former attorney general on the upper, upper right of the screen and, uh, and American hostages, including the one on the lower left of the screen, were, um, were rescued by the Colombian military in Operation Hake. The controversy about, about perfidy comes in with regard to a, one of the tactics employed. Now, um, I, I've talked to um, Colombian officers about this and Colombian JAGs, and, and they say that the use of a Red Cross symbol by one of the people on the aircraft wearing a T-shirt with a Red Cross on it was, was an error and not part of the plan. Uh, be that as it may, um, I, I would like to analyze whether or not um, it was an act of perfidy because it resulted in the capture of uh, the FARC members that were accompanying the hostages. And I would say that um, capture is not a customary international law um, standard for perfidy. Why do I say that? Well, because um, it wasn't included in Hague 1907. That was about treacherous killing or wounding. It's not included as a grave breach in Article 85 of Additional Protocol 1. The, if you read carefully the grave breach provision, it says that um, it's a grave breach to uh, kill or wound someone by virtue of, uh, of perfidy. And, and I would uh, submit that uh, it's a persistent practice of states, particularly in non-international armed conflict, to use ruses to capture, um, and particularly uh, as you get closer to the law enforcement side of the, of the uh, spectrum of conflict in, in non-international armed conflict, to use ruses to uh, capture or arrest um, the criminals that uh, are the, the combatants in non-international armed conflict. Okay, there's, a, there's another aspect of, uh, non, of perfidy here, and that is the, the, this, I, I, I would submit the most important part of perfidy for NIAC, it, it, particularly for distinction, is the feigning of civilian status. Well, um, Article 44 of Additional Protocol 1 basically authorizes the feigning of civilian status by carrying um, an, an, an arm, arms openly in the attack. So is, uh, d does that water down the effect of perfidy? I say definitely, and, that's, and that really underlines why the U.S. will never sign um, additional Protocol 1, at least in, in terms of, uh, or without being able to minimize the impact of Article 44. And, and the, the, the problem is illustrated by the picture on the right, but by a place like Afghanistan, where everybody carries an AK-47. Are they all a target in NIAC? No. Um, there's got to be distinction still um, done in, in targeting um, the, the civilians who are carrying a weapon to defend their homes in a place like, uh, like Afghanistan. Now, um, a, a good illustration of the um, feigning civilian status aspect of perfidy is in the Jawad case. Jawad was, was a young man um, who uh, was certainly uh, around uh, 16, um, and at the time it, he committed his offense of throwing a grenade into a Jeep that was passing by a street in, uh, in Kabul. Now, um, the Military Commissions Act contains an additional proof, an additional element of proof that requires the uh, prosecutors to prove that in addition to uh, being charged with the act of murdering a lawful combatant, they have to prove that there was a violation of the law of war. One alternative approach to this element, I would submit, a proof, is to prove that it was done in a perfidious manner. Um, uh, it, there, 
there's already been a lot of argument and discussion about the uh, about murder of a lawful combatant, whether or not that's a violation of the law of war, whether it's a domestic law violation or a violation of the international law of war. But I would submit that as to this element of proof, if you can prove perfidy, you have met your element of proof. And it doesn't require a detrimental reliance, um, I would submit, that just the tactic of launching your attack from the civilian populace in a crowded market um, is an act of perfidy. We'll see. Um, maybe the next time uh, that that charge is made, um, we can make that uh, we can make that argument from the prosecution side. Okay. What about um, government forces in in NIAC? Um, someone earlier, I think uh, Mike said that that uh, you don't have to wear uniforms in in uh, NIAC. I, I agree with that, um, but there are some, in order to, to um, affect the protection of civilians, it's still important for government forces to distinguish themselves in certain instances. So um, it's, it is a hybrid mission. Um, you know, we talk about in the coin manual of the, the really the spectrum of law and, and uh, force in, in uh, non-international armed conflict. And sometimes you're using law enforcement um, in the lead. You know, Iraq right, right now or since the security agreement is law enforcement in the lead, the military in support. So, um, so the, the host nation authorities, the support to host na nation authorities becomes paramount along this spectrum at some point in time. And so, um, but uh, there, the raison d'etre of COIN is protection of the civilian populace. And so somehow we have to work this out. Um, in, in current issues in Afghanistan, both uh, uh, over the last three or four months, we've developed a, a memorandum for U.S. forces in Afghanistan that tells them when and where they should be wearing uniforms and when they should be carrying uh, uh, concealed weapons. I would submit that um, that this is the right standard. Offensive military activities should, uh, military forces should be wearing, wearing a uniform. When they're in support of host nation officials, when they're providing uh, advice about agriculture or about uh, the rule of law or uh, advising a, a local ministry, the, the distinction principle is not that important. But when they're engaged in offensive military activities, then that puts the, um, the civilian populace at risk. Oh, I meant to go back. Um, and that, what, what, that, what does that do? That puts us really in the same position that the law enforcement um, officers are. The point of this lower right-hand slide is that when the DEA makes a bust, they identify themselves. Why is that? That's so they, that the, the drug uh, lord doesn't think it's a rival drug gang that's attacking him, so that, the, that they're not threatening the civilians that live across the street. They identify themselves clearly when they go in the attack mode in, in law enforcement. So with respect to uh, uh, military operations um, and sometimes in support of law enforcement, we should clearly identify ourselves as uh, military members. That, this, I think this carrying of concealed weapon issue is a, is a red herring. And my recommendation with, with uh, this memorandum was to um, not to refer to perfidy at all in the carrying of concealed weapons. Carrying of concealed weapons is a matter for status of forces agreements and uh, application of host nation law, not, not a matter of, uh, of perfidy. But wearing a uniform is important to, uh, to ensure that our military forces identify themselves in their military operations and not engage in perfidy. Thank you, sir. We will now uh, uh, open the floor to the question and answer period. Professor. Charles Garraway. My question is to Bill Boothby on expanding bullets, and I suspect he's uh, not surprised by that. I would like to know what is the legal effect of the resolution passed in Kampala, bearing in mind Article 21 of the ICC statute, <coughs> 
the court shall apply in the first place this statute, elements of crimes, and its rules of procedure and evidence. The statute itself seems to be crystal clear. There is a prohibition on the use of expanding bullets. The elements of crimes, which do contain part of that uh, resolution, are of course advisory to the court only. So how do you bring in that resolution in a criminal case? And linked to that, I would ask, is this a situation where in fact there is a conflict or a possible conflict between law of armed conflict and human rights law? Nayaks are a classic example of war amongst the people. And in a hostage situation with a belligerent nexus, if the use of expanding bullets is unlawful, and as a result, they are not used in that hostage situation, and civilians die as a direct result of the choice of alternative ammunition, would that be a possible breach of human rights and laying open the country to a possible human rights uh, charge? Taking your second question first, there might even be a conflict within the law of armed conflict because you might well have a conflict between the principle of distinction on the one hand and the application of the rule on the other if using the wrong ammunition creates an unnecessarily greater risk for the civilian population than would have been the case had you applied the expanding ammunition in the circumstances. And therefore, I think it would be rather strange if the particular were to be the enemy of the general in the context that you've described. Whether there is a conflict in relation to human rights law, I think you will be better employed posing to the lady sitting uh, one or two points adrift of you on your right. As to the first point, oh my goodness, oh what a tangled web we weave <laughs> when at first we strive to deceive. Um, I, I think in all seriousness, you raise a very valid point. Um, I have to be very careful as to what I say, given the fact that I did give certain advice in advance of the Kampala conference, which I think I'm at liberty to say was not translated into uh, what emerged from that conference. And I will say no more than that on that particular point. Um, I think I think what we have is a dog's breakfast. I think it's crazy. I think it sits very, very uncomfortably with the practice of states. Um, and I think it's gonna sit even more uncomfortably with what I anticipate is going to be the future practice of states. More than that, I would prefer not to say. Professor. Push the button, please, sir. I'm sorry, I always forget to do it. Why uh, the permission to law enforcement uh, agencies to use hollow point bullets? Because of the need to use them against the terrorist. It's the only way to drop a terrorist. Otherwise, the terrorist has still an opportunity to push the button and to explode, assuming that he's a suicide bomber. Now, you have today drawn a very clear cut, an absolute distinction between IAC and IAC. In your book, in so far as IAC is concerned, you are pointing out very potently, in my opinion, that terrorism can be used even in that context. And therefore, in your opinion, the prohibition, the absolute prohibition of uh, the use of expanding and hollow point bullets is wrong because it should be permitted even in an IAC against terrorists. Have you now backpedaled? Well, you if, you, uh, if you heard what I, I said, Yoram, that was precisely what I was hinting at in my comments here. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not saying it's wrong in international armed conflict. What I'm saying is that it's a situation where there is clearly 
a, a conventional rule based on the 1899 text that prohibits it for states party to that text in international armed conflicts, but I'm not convinced that that is a customary rule. What I suspect is that we could find a situation in which state practice going forward from now, as it were, deviates increasingly from that um, position such that you could have a situation where, say, had we, been, had we been discussing this matter in 1980, all would have been convinced without question that there was a, a, a rule of customary law, whereas, say, when we discussed this matter in 2020 or 2025, or those of us who are still around at that time, um, we would come to the conclusion that there is perhaps no longer a customary rule on that on, uh, to that extent because state practice may well have deviated. I personally can't see why um, the, the issue, as it were, that we've identified should be regarded as only applying in the context of a non-international armed conflict. I think that the hostage-taker scenario is just as likely to arise these days in the context of an international armed conflict. The question, the big unanswered question, is how states in practice are going to react to that sort of circumstance. I really suggest that you calibrate the point in the final printed version of your paper because you haven't made it clear in the oral presentation, if you don't mind my saying so. Okay, uh, Wolf, ICTY, you have to take it uh, actually into account that the statute of the ICTY is completely different from the ICC Rome Statute and Kampala Amendment because the ICC has jurisdiction only in a non-retroactive fashion and once it uh, exercises jurisdiction it doesn't matter whether the offense listed in Article 8 is customary international law or not the treaty is valid anyhow. ICTY, that's not the case, since the statute was adopted by the Security Council after the events. As a result, the ICTY is compelled, as admitted already publicly, both by Meron and by Fausto Pucca, to invariably say that every single time they convict a person, this is based on customary international law. Otherwise, nulla nullum crimen sine lege, nulla puena sine lege. Therefore, one should not take seriously every single decision of the ICTY that it's customary international law. They simply have put themselves in a vice, as it were. So bear that in mind when you are referring to the ICTY. Uh, no, that's merely a comment. Uh, finally, Dick, there was confusion, unfortunately, in your presentation between perfidy on the one hand, which is relative, and improper use of emblem, which is absolute. You are not allowed to use improperly the emblem of the Red Cross, no matter what, irrespective of whether you kill, injure, capture, or uh, whatever. You are simply not allowed to do it. It's a different provision in article, uh, in the relative, in the, I'm sorry in the proper article of uh, Protocol 1. On the other hand, insofar as perfidy is concerned, this is a relative position. That is to say, you are not allowed to kill, injure, and then in brackets, or capture, only in order to invite, uh, only in circumstances which invite confidence. Meaning that, if it's not in circumstances that invite confidence, or you are not killing, injuring, or capturing, there is no problem. Improper use is a different uh, matter altogether. Well, I, I, I understand completely, and, uh, and I apologize for confusing that point, but um, I, I still submit that perfidy, um, particularly as a grave breach, gives a, a, a hammer to the uh, to the uh, misuse um, prohibition, and that and that that's really my point. That uh, per perfidy is, is indeed a, a relative um, a prohibition, but um, what it does is it makes uh, 
um, it, it gives ammunition to the uh, to those that are uh, prohibiting that conduct, and uh, and when it becomes a great breach, it uh, you can be slam dunked for it. So, uh, you know, I, I I understand the the distinction though. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Major Pierce, uh, for Mr. Jackson, uh, simply asking as a devil's advocate, but uh, considering our, the iconic photo of uh, Special Forces invading Afghanistan back in 2001, dressed up as the locals on horseback, uh, also more recently, uh, as newspaper articles have pointed out, the allies of NATO in Libya are not in uniform, or at least haven't been up until recently and in, in every respect are acting as what we charge elsewhere as unlawful combatants because they don't have insignia, uh, you know, aren't wearing uniforms, et cetera. So isn't, in some ways, and again, perception on the world, and that is important, or at least a vast majority of the world, isn't it possible that a large portion of the world is beginning to see this as sort of a wealthy nation's privilege that we're asserting? Uh, we can afford for somebody without a uniform on in Las uh, Nevada to direct a drone in an attack that kills somewhat indiscriminately uh, on the other side of the world, but them, you know, meaning them being uh, whoever, you know, the adversary somewhere who can't afford that type of technology, uh, puts on a suicide vest and, and kills a large number of people, uh, you know, maybe uh, soldiers in a convoy or something, we call that perfidy and a war crime. So again, isn't there a risk that a, much, a large portion of the world may see this as us having our cake and eating it too? and having a dual standard, and how do we overcome that perception? Well, I, I, I think you pointed out the, the real uh, problem with asymmetric warfare in general, um, which is uh, the asymmetric, uh, through asymmetric warfare, the weak employ tactics to overcome the strong. Um, and so the, this, this is a force multiplying uh, effort by, by the, the uh, the insurgents or the or the terrorists to overcome the strength of of uh, the military and and uh, uh, host nation forces, uh, but um, I think my point is that um, that there's certainly no reci uh, there's no reciprocity here in 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 NIAC. I mean, we've already pointed out clearly that the other guys are committing crimes. They're unprivileged belligerents or unlawful combatants. So, um, and, and they're gonna employ tactics which need to be sanctioned. Well, they sanction themselves, they blow themselves up. Um, and those that we catch, we prosecute and put away forever. Um, and, and then those that we find that are building the bombs, we, uh, we target. Uh, but, uh, but that does not take away um, our own obligation to distinguish ourselves from civilians and uh, in combat, and to dis and to uh, apply the principle of distinction, because there's a protective principle that we're obligated to to apply. Um, if we if we don't do that, we're not conducting disciplined operations. Number one, we're going to lose the the uh, local populace um, in a heartbeat. Uh, you know, you can see the impact of civilian casualties of any kind in Afghanistan, for example. Uh, and, and we lose the legitimacy of our actions by not, not applying those rules. I would uh, disagree with your contention that, the, uh, that use of non-standard uniforms is not applying the principle of distinction. I think it does. Hayes wrote a long article on that in the Chicago Law Review. I, his point was not that we should uh, uh, engage in perfidy like the other guys do. His point was that we don't have to distinguish ourselves with the standard uh, BDU uniform as long as we distinguish ourselves. Those, t those uh, special forces folks were, were riding with Northern Alliance people dressed just like them. Dre they were clearly distinguishable in the, their offensive actions against uh, the Taliban in 2001-2002. Any further questions? Yes, sir. Uh, 
Colonel Duchenne, Netherlands Defense Academy. Question for Mr. Jackson. Um, I was a bit puzzled by your uh, remarks about the uh, perfidy and the uh, freedom fighters dressing up in, in civilian clothing. Uh, could, could, you, could you, by example, well, for example, by, by giving some practice, uh, de yeah, demarcate where the perfidious acts would start? And, and then a secondary question, so if it's perfidy, what does it help us? Yeah, I, th I think I was suggesting that uh, with, uh, if, if you're entering a village um, where everybody in the village has an AK-47 and is wearing civilian clothes and is no way distinguishing them themselves from the civilian populace, that you could consider it perfidy to their, uh, launch an attack on the lawful government or, or uh, military forces that are entering a village, not in an attack, but in a, 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 a visit to a village. So, um, and, and that's, I think that's a very controversial notion, and, but, but the point that, um, that Article 44 is blurring the distinction, I, I think is still, still manifest in, uh, in, in uh, and, and the key problem in uh, application of additional protocol one. Uh, I, I, we probably, I, I, that's a really tough argument to make. Um, for example, in the Jawad situation, say Jawad was standing on the corner in Kabul with a AK-47 in his hand, um, rather than hiding a, a grenade. Um, could, would that, would the throwing of that grenade into the, into the, um, Jeep be an act of perfidy? I don't know. Maybe it's maybe worth an argument to, to make that uh, element of the offense, uh, but but I think it's a tougher sell, and I think I think you're right to point it out that it's a it's a it's a tough argument to make. Of course. Professor, could you use the uh, button, please? It is not standard. Nevertheless, there is distinction. He's right about that. And as a matter of fact, uh, this has come out as a result of a debate here in Newport more than 10 years ago when Hayes attempted originally to defend uh, the use of those cavalry people under Rumsfeld in Afghanistan uh, somewhat uh, excessively. He reflected upon it and came up with this, in my opinion, entirely appropriate solution. Substandard is okay, provided that there is distinction. Now, about uh, your question, which is, in my opinion, a very good question, the answer, the correct answer, in my opinion, is as follows. The question is, are you merely behaving in a way which uh, is uh, indicative that you have relinquished the right to be a lawful com combatant. You are not fighting in uniform. You don't want to fight in uniform. Meaning that, should you be captured, you will not be treated as a lawful combatant. You will not be a POW. That's one thing. This has nothing to do with perfidy. Perfidy means that you are going beyond that, inviting confidence. And then you are killing, injuring, or capturing. That's a different situation altogether and it's easy to show examples from the practice of states. You might be able to argue that you're inviting confidence by j just by being a, a village guy carrying carrying your, your weapon um, because everybody does it you know so I, I mean I, I, I think it's a tough sell but but it's a but but it's a question of whether or not that's that's your intent. Sorry, Dick. This is another item of confusion. If you don't mind. 
the EU have actually lumped together two different conditions of lawful combatancy. One is the need to identify yourself with a recognizable emblem of a combatant, and the other is the issue of carrying your arms openly, which is Article 44. The two actually do not necessarily come together. As a matter of fact, here is a very good example. You are an American soldier. You are fighting in Mufti. You are not in uniform, but you are using an, um, an American issue of a weapon, the M1, whatever, right? Then there is no attempt to invite confidence. However, if you are an American soldier in Afghanistan and you are carrying a Kalachnikov, excuse me, that's perfidy. Yes, General. I would like to direct my question to Mr. Jackson. Uh, we have been involved in counterinsurgency, or you know, uh, we have been a, we have the longest uh, communist insurgency running in the country for almost four decades. And uh, I would like to ask if this is perfidious act in your according to the rules. Uh, we could not actually operate against the guerrillas if we are in distinct uniform. So sometimes we do hybrid missions where our soldiers uh, on intelligence mission dress up like guerrillas. And of course the guerrillas also have the same weapons as the armed forces of the Philippines. They use M16s, M14s, and a few uh, AK-47. So in order to be able to they have all the guerrillas usually establish a network of uh, early warning systems for uh, utilizing civilians. So we could not actually get near them, their camps or their locations. So we do some hybrid missions where our soldiers are in civilians. And also in the same manner, the guerrillas, in order to attack our detachments or outposts, they sometimes wear military uniforms so that they could conduct the raid. So do you think this is uh, these are perfidious act because this has been going on for, you know, we, we both sides have been doing this, uh, to, you know, in order to uh, achieve the, uh, our own objectives. Uh, uh, do you think these are perfidious acts? Well, that's why I suggested that uh, that uh, wear of enemy uniforms um, is considered by some as perfidious because you're inviting the reliance on uh, the other side being uh, t treating you as a as a member of their their forces um, uh, it's clear in it's clearly prohibited in international armed conflict to wear enemy uniforms um, and as uh, the NIAC manual also says it's a prohibited act to wear um, enemy enemy uniforms but um, the the key case in IAC is the Scorzini case where um, Otto Scorzini was prosecuted for, in the Battle of the Bulge, having his forces, um, his commando forces wear uh, U.S. uniforms, was depicted in the movie, The Battle of the Bulge. Um, but he was acquitted. It, it's an international military tribunal case. He was acquitted because um, the instructions were for them to remove their, their American uniforms and distinguish themselves in battle with the Americans. And they, he said that uh, they, they said that some of their folks were captured before they had uh, had the chance to do that. So um, uh, now, whether or not it's perfidy in a non-international armed conflict is is controversial. Um, but uh, I would submit that as as militaries of of, of nations that are generally complying with the law of war and the principle of distinction, we should, in combat, um, distinguish ourselves from the civilian populace as well as from, from the guerrillas. Um, but th I'm, I'm sure there are some that would argue that's a legitimate ruse of war in a NIAC because distinguishing ourselves from the guerrillas 
is not necessarily a, something that, that a, a value that the law of war is, is uh, pushing. So um, it's, a, it's a close, close call on, in my, from my perspective, but as I said, our advice to our, our uh, military folks in NIAC is to always distinguish themselves in offensive operations. Excuse me for intervening, but uh, I don't understand this discussion. There are, there are two different pro prohibitions out there. One is the prohibition of perfidy, and I'm only talking international armed conflict now, and the other is the prohibition of uh, pretending to be the enemy by wearing the enemy's uniform. If you are you, uh, wearing the enemy's uniform, that's a clear violation of a distinct prohibition, but it's not perfidy. How could it be perfidy? Because the enemy is not protected under the law of armed conflict. So only if you feign protected status, we can talk about perfidy at all. Now the next question is, again, would we be able to transfer the prohibition of wearing the enemy's uniform, which is an international armed conflict prohibition, can we transfer that to the non-international armed conflict? And, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't think there is a clear answer to that. Certainly, there is no treaty law, and certainly uh, one can doubt whether there has, been, uh, there has emerged a customary rule to that effect. But at the end of the day, one answer is clear. It is not perfidy. Any more questions? We have 25 minutes. We don't have to use them. Sorry, I was just going to add one point, and that is that the um, additional provision that uh, Wolf was referring to, of course, is Article 39 of AP1. Um, paragraph 1 of that article reads, it is prohibited to make use in an armed conflict of the flags or military emblems, insignia or uniforms of neutral or other states, not parties to the conflict. So you could say, really, that um, that provision, as written, only applies to the uniforms of state armed forces, and you would therefore argue that there would be no reciprocity if you were st to start talking about the applicability of that rule as written in a non-international armed conflict, and that lack of reciprocity would in, in itself, in my view, be um, a first obstruction, if you like, to any suggestion that the rule would uh, translate across into NIAC. Uh, it's, it's not an insuperable <coughs> of, of objection. Um, but I think it's the, um, it, it's the first thing that you need to get, get across. Yes, ma'am. Um, first, just a comment. It's actually, in the manual of non-international non conflict, they, they do include the uh, prohibition on use of uh, enemy military emblems and do not include, as perfidy, um, the use of civilian uh, uh, clothes or feigning civilian status. And, and I think that there is, there is a certain logic with uh, regard to uh, feigning civilian status in, in situations where the other side is not wearing uniform and is not differentiating between civilians and combatants, especially when it is used to come closer to the, to the other side, maybe, and maybe when actual engagement, there is some kind of, uh, of identification, as you say, but I think that to, in order to come close to the other, to the other, to the enemy forces uh, that are within, inside, uh, uh, within a civilian, uh, 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 entrenched usually in a civilian uh, population, it is, uh, it is sometimes only possible by, uh, by uh, uh, coming in civilian clothes, and I think the examples from other countries uh, reflect also our experience. Um, and, then, and the question, uh, with regard to uh, this, the um, chemical uh, convention, the, the, the CWC, and the prohibition on tear gas and other substances that are um, chemical substances but are, can be used not as lethal uh, uh, weapons but to the, for example, in uh, disturbances. Here again, they are not allowed in international armed conflict. And what do you think about their, that applicabil the applicability of this uh, prohibition in non-international armed conflicts 
and in situations where you have the, especially when you have uh, situations of law enforcement and non-international armed conflicts uh, combined, as was uh, discussed earlier. Taking your second point, um, it, the prohibition in relation to tear gas is use as uh, a method of warfare, of course. Um, I think I would probably see that as applying equally in relation to either category of conflict. I would see no explicit wording in the treaty to apply it to one uh, type of warfare and not to another type of warfare. Um, but I'd be happy to talk offline if you have in mind a particular difficulty that you're immediately going to hit me with that I haven't immediately thought of. Uh, I see by the expression on uh, your colleague's face that that is exactly the case. Um, in relation to the first part of your question, the question that crosses my mind is how do you feign civilian status in a category of conflict where there is no such thing as combatant status. Discuss. Good one for the examinations, for those who are uh, trying to think of something interesting for their students to write about. Uh, Nina, I, I'd say that uh, 2.3.5 uh, refers to protected status, and, and that would include civilians in, in my, my view. Um, and I think that puts a whole, uh, that includes the uh, number of different categories from uh, Article 37. Uh, as to the method of warfare issue, uh, I, I think the U.S. view is that the, although again we're not signatories to the ICC, um, that uh, the method of warfare provision has to be interpreted in light of uh, our practice and our practice including the Senate ratification of the Chemical Weapons Convention includes the use of RCA to separate civilians from combatants in a case where they're being mixed to uh, rescue down pilots to uh, deal with uh, um, insurrection behind the lines and, and riots of prisoners so those uh, those examples are not methods of warfare by definition under under our, our US approach I want to say something briefly about uh, manual, manuals. I've changed my, my view on this, and it's because of working at, uh, at San Remo with the San Remo um, ROE manual produced very much by this school. Um, I, I don't personally believe that manuals, um, that manuals like this are necessarily a statement of what the law is, I mean, and I'm, and Clearly, the U.S. in its uh, uh, Dr. Kellenberger letter disagrees with many statements of what customary international law is, um, but uh, it's, these are very useful for um, starting points for discussion, for, for to have some common ground to, uh, to teach, to talk about these issues. And that's, that's why I, I pointed this out um, today. Um, uh, two years ago or three years ago, I would have said, manual, you know, that's that's Mike Schmidt on NIAC and uh, not, not uh, customary international law. But, I, but, but uh, after working a couple of times at San Remo, I realize how useful um, these documents are as uh, starting points for discussion or, or for a professor to, to uh, write a law school exam out of. Now that uh, Dick has told us how great manuals are, let me argue with him. Uh, first of all, let me clear up Panina's point with regard to perfidy and the absence of the mention of civilians. Uh, in 236, it's or otherwise have protected status, and we meant by that civilians. We just chose another, we chose other examples has clearer. But civilians are certainly included. Now, with regard to 235, uh, I've just consulted with one of the other authors and since there are only three of us, the majority wins. Uh, we think that rule's wrong. And uh, so, uh, <laughs> so it's uh, at least our contention at the moment that it is not a violation of the law of armed conflict to wear enemy military emblems during such situations. How All right, now we're down to two to one, apparently going the other way. It's not a violation to wear, you just said you didn't like that. 
That in an IAC. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, of course, in an IAC. I mean, that's black letter law. Here we're talking about in an IAC, and we think that we we allowed that to bleed over into NIAC in a way that was perhaps too liberal. Uh, we are looking to do a second edition to the manual. We don't have a funder yet. If you'd be interested in funding the project, please contact me as quickly as possible. And with that, please join me in thanking our panel, and we'll see you in 45 minutes.